Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Universe Within Podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple for a number of years now, uh, so I can really attest to the quality of work that they do. They are located in the Peruvian Amazon outside the city of Iquitos, and they are predominantly working with the plant medicine ayahuasca, working in a lineage of a group of people called the Shipibo people, who have a really long knowledge of working with ayahuasca, and really just the whole pharmacopoeia of plants that exist in the Amazon rainforest, uh, which uh, my guest for today actually goes in and speaks a bit about that. Um, they're running 12-day workshops in which they hold six different ceremonies, working with four different uh, doctors, vegetalistas, curanderos, um, just an amazing support staff, an amazing integration team, uh, yoga teachers, facilitators, uh, just a, a really amazing environment to go really deeply into this work. So if you're interested in working with ayahuasca in a, in a quite traditional setting and uh, going really deeply into this this world of plants and plant medicine, healing, learning. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go and experience this medicine. So if you would like more information about them, you can check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org. Also, myself and my colleague, Marab Artsy, uh, if you're interested in learning more about her, I also interviewed her, I believe, in episode 28 of this show, are continuing to run plant dietas, <clears throat> predominantly working in a lineage of working with tobacco and tree barks. Uh, we just finished a few dietas, and the next one we're going to be running is in February here in Peru in the Sacred Valley. Uh, we'll also be in New York in the summer um, and probably Europe as well, um, and some other dates here in Peru, but we're still trying to sort all of that out. Obviously, with the current worldwide situation, planning isn't the easiest thing at the moment. Um, but if you'd like to learn more information about that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org and Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. And it's a really beautiful opportunity uh, to, to go very deeply into the world of plants, into the world of dieting, isolation, fasting, and working with some of these master plants to really experience the, the teaching, the learning, the healing that they have to offer. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, my guest for today is Jeremy Narby. Probably many of you have heard of him. He's an anthropologist. Uh, he wrote a very popular book called The Cosmic Serpent. And uh, I, I brought him on today uh, to speak about a new book that he wrote, which is called Plant Teachers, uh, I believe, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge. And it's a really beautiful book. It's a, it's a rather short read, which I, I think is really good in a way because it's, uh, it's kind of a concentrated book of a lot of wisdom. And it was written by him and a... Um, um, a guy who also works with tobacco and ayahuasca. Uh, his name is Rafael Chanchardi. I may be pronouncing the, his last name incorrectly. Uh, but he's an indigenous doctor who works and lives in Nikitos in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, he teaches with both of these plants and he works with them. So it's a really beautiful book talking about both ayahuasca and tobacco. There's many books that have been written about ayahuasca now and increasingly a uh, large number, but very, very little information and literature on tobacco. And as Jeremy talks about tobacco, uh, for many of the people in the Amazon is considered uh, the, the main plant medicine. And uh, there's, there's kind of a surprisingly little information about it. It's a plant that, that I work with that I've uh, had a tremendous benefit from and, and really being able to see its, its, its value, its knowledge, its power. So Jeremy does a really beautiful job in collaboration with Raphael of bringing that knowledge to light. Um, so in this interview, we, we talk a bit about his background, uh, a bit about his time with the Ashaninka, ayahuasca, and tobacco. So... It was a really good interview. Uh, I think he does a really good job of expressing himself, a little bit about his background, some stories with these medicines, and uh, and I think you all will get a lot out of it. So I hope you enjoy it. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me to continue to be able to bring on guests like Jeremy. Um, 
Patreon is a really beautiful option to support this podcast. It's a subscription service. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for, and those tiers also give you some added benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, a chance to do Q&As. So that's a really big help in helping me uh, with this podcast. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I, as always, really appreciate your support. There's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal, And also with YouTube now, there's the ability to join the channel, offering a lot of the same perks as the Patreon page. Uh, If you're not able to do that, as always, subscribing to the show is really big help. So with YouTube channel, hitting the subscribe button, uh, liking the videos, turning on the notification bell. um, And then with the audio version, still Apple Podcasts is the biggest one. So following the show. And if you can, leaving a starred rating and a short review, uh, those are all really big uh, things that help with the algorithms to get the show out to a bigger audience. So I think that's enough uh, talking for the intro, and without further ado, here is my conversation with Jeremy. Running up from the maze, run out of the maze today. It's wonderful to have you. Um, I think a, a lot of the audience is probably familiar with you. Um, I, for a long time, I, I worked and, and I still work at the, the big Amazonian ayahuasca center, the Temple of the Way of Light, which I, I think you've been to. And yep. um, we have a, a pretty nice library there. And one of the the very popular books you can tell by how worn out it is, <laughs> is the uh, the Cosmic Serpent, and it's always a, a very popular read there. So, I think a large part of the audience will be familiar with you, but maybe just to start, if you can give a little bit of background, because I think a lot of people are familiar with your work through that book, but probably a lot of people don't know a bit more about your story. So, um, yeah, maybe just a bit about your background to start. Sure. Um, well, let's see. I grew up in um, uh, Montreal, and then my parents moved to Switzerland when I was 10. So I was always kind of in between cultures and languages. And um, I ended up studying anthropology. And this led me to do uh, research uh, for a doctorate in anthropology in the Peruvian Amazon in the 1980s, mainly political and economic in the sense that uh, it was a question of human rights and um, whether indigenous people have the right to own their lands or not and the World Bank development policies and, and so forth. Um, and so that's what led me to study how Ashanika people in the Peruvian Amazon used the forest and thought about the forest. And um, well, that's what led me directly to an interest in plants like uh, ayahuasca and tobacco, simply because the indigenous people of the Peruvian Amazon and the Ashaninka in particular would, would point to these plants as the origin of their knowledge. So anytime you'd ask them what they knew about the forest or about plants or animals, it would end up uh, uh, with a conversation about ayahuasca and tobacco. Um, Well, um, that's all very well. I actually wrote a dissertation uh, for Stanford University uh, that was finished in 1990 and that hardly actually explored the question of tobacco or ayahuasca and looked at how Ashaninka people used the rainforest rationally. And then I became an, an activist for the initiatives of indigenous Amazonian people. I started working for a Swiss NGO called Nouvelle Planet, New Planet. And um, I've been working for them for the last 31 years, um, promoting autonomy. Um, uh, allowing indigenous Amazonian people to say what they think is important. So demarcating their lands, owning their lands, uh, having bilingual education programs for their children, uh, having fish farms if their rivers have been contaminated by oil companies, setting up sustainable forestry projects so that they can uh, have access to uh, the market, but in an ecologically sustainable way, and so on. 
the premise being that the people who know best about what's good for Amazonian people uh, are Amazonian people themselves. And so my job as a, a, an activist or a fundraiser is to listen to them, uh, let them propose initiatives. And then if we think that the, the, these initiatives make sense, we look for funding for them. So most of the time, instead of being an anthropologist, which means that you study people, I actually stopped studying people a long time ago and I started working for them. Um, you know, uh, so, and then this is a fairly bureaucratic uh, uh, activity. In other words, uh, uh, 11 months of the year, I'm not uh, exploring deep rainforests. I'm uh, going through deep piles of paper that are that are all around me here, and um, uh, you know, I mean, I was I was writing out a report uh, just just before talking with you, where you it's pages and pages, and you know, when you ask people for money to demarcate territories, then twelve months later you have to send them a report telling them what actually happened. Well, actually, what actually happened during the last 12 months was not very much because of the pandemic and so forth, the political chaos in Peru. So then, you know, you have to write that up. So actually, a fair amount of my time is writing, but still, you know, if so, if people say, what are you? I'd like to give a simple answer, like say, I'm a plumber, you know. Um, the simple answer is I'm an anthropologist, but uh, practically, I'm a fundraiser and uh, a projects manager and a report writer. And then sometimes I write books. And the books that I write uh, is, are usually about trying to make the uh, indigenous Amazonian view of uh, plants, animals, the world understandable to non-Amazonian people. So. I wrote The Cosmic Serpent 26 years ago. Uh, I published Intelligence in Nature in 2005. And now with Rafael uh, Pisuri Chanchari, who, who is a, an indigenous expert from the Shawi people and who works for the bilingual intercultural education program of the indigenous people of the Peruvian Amazon, which is one of the organizations that we've been backing for a long time. Uh, he actually teaches there teaching young indigenous people to teach in their own language and culture. Uh, this is about having young indigenous Amazonian people learning their own mother tongue and their own culture and knowledge, and at the same time, learning Spanish and science and so on. So bilingual, intercultural, the idea being that th this is necessary for these cultures and people and their knowledge to survive. So. Rafael Chanchari is like a, an indigenous intellectual because he teaches indigenous knowledge to indigenous people. And um, so he and I teamed up and, and, and dialogued uh, about tobacco and ayahuasca. So, you know, what's the big idea here? Well, it's quite simply that these are two Amazonian plants that uh, there's more than a billion people in the world using tobacco uh, on a daily basis. And uh, then there's ayahuasca, which gets a lot of media space. There's a, a far fewer people using ayahuasca, but people talk about it a lot. So these are two powerful Amazonian plants that are considered teacher plants by indigenous Amazonian people, but that, that are then, uh, well, tobacco has been turned into industrial cigarettes, with, which are uh, problematic, and we might talk about that. And then ayahuasca gets all this other kind of press and, and attention. But actually, my view is that uh, the people who really know how to use these plants are the indigenous people in the uh, in Amazonia because they've been working with them so much longer than anybody else, uh, working with these plants in, in their pure form when it comes to tobacco. Um, and they don't often get the microphone. Um, and, and even when anthropologists write about them, it's, it tends to always be kind of secondhand and so on. Um, what we tried to do with Raphael in this book was like split it 50-50, where essentially uh, there are four chapters. He gets the mic for two and I get the mic for another two. Um, I mean, we're dialoguing throughout. Um, I'm asking questions when he has the mic and then 
I'm using his answers to guide my research into the scientific literature when I get the mic. And the idea is that actually science and indigenous knowledge can speak to each other. And when you bring together what science has to say about, well, these two plants in, in, this, in this case, it could be something else. Like when, when I wrote about intelligence in nature, that was the idea there too, that we look at what indigenous Amazonian people say about the intelligence of plants and animals, then look at what science says about the same. And, and lo and behold, there's all kinds of common ground that emerges if you're willing to see it. Um, so, and then, so what's the point for an activist like me to reveal common ground between science and indigenous knowledge? Well, it, it's all about uh, promoting uh, an appreciation of the importance of these uh, neglected uh, cultures and, and people, and, and also show that actually the, these, this is a very important uh, ecosystem, the Amazonian forest. These people live there. They're on the front lines. They have deep knowledge about it that uh, doesn't often correspond, that often doesn't correspond to uh, scientific uh, criteria, but there's, there's still a lot of knowledge in there. And um, yeah, I think that actually by associating the, the, the two different approaches to knowledge, you can get a richer understanding of, of what we're talking about. And I'd invite readers not only to uh, look at the book and, and read it, but yeah, to, to, to think about it that way. You can read the chapters where the Indigenous expert is giving his point of view on tobacco and then ayahuasca, then read the scientific chapters that uh, give you an update of what research is saying uh, uh, about the same. And then you can make up your own mind. Um, <clears throat> my, my view, I don't want to tell people how to, how to think or how to, how to interpret the book, but I, I can share my point of view, which is that um, I think both views are, are complementary. And that uh, what I've learned is that uh, it's possible, uh, kind of by analogy with bilingualism, to be bicognitive. In other words, you can be a Westerner like me and kind of a hard-boiled rationalist and think in terms of what would science say about this plant? What are the molecules it contains? What receptors on which neurons do the different molecules uh, uh, work on? And then what happens? That's one thing. And then you can switch and look at, well, so how would uh, indigenous Amazonian people think about the same thing? And what would they say? And you could, these are like uh, complementary camera angles. So you look at things from one main angle, but then sometimes you look at the reverse angle and you see things that you wouldn't see otherwise and come up with new ideas. So finally, that's the, the bottom line is promoting intercultural understanding. Yeah, beautiful. Before we get into the book, you, you mentioned in the beginning of your, your kind of career and time where you began to be interested in plant medicines, you, you spent time with the Ashaninka. And I think a lot of people familiar with plant medicine, especially with ayahuasca, there's, there's a lot of people studying with Shipibo or in Brazil, there's, there's very much the big ayahuasca churches. But I think a lot of people don't realize that there's many, many indigenous groups in the Amazon working with these plants. Could you speak a little bit about your time with the Ashaninka and, and maybe kind of what you learned? I mean, I, I know that's a huge question, but but were there things yeah. that shifted where, where maybe what you had thought coming into that, you began to see things from a different angle when you lived with them? Um, in terms of the ayahuasca and tobacco proper or just the whole experience of living with them? I think just the whole experience, but yeah, I mean, definitely because yeah. the Ashaninka are, are known for especially using those two plants. So I'm sure yeah. there was some, some learning of, 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 you know, especially those mm -hmm. two plants and, and, and as you said, like a very different worldview, you know, because mm -hmm. as I think you, you really wisely mentioned, there is this idea of cosmovision, which we often only associate with a more kind of indigenous way of, of looking at the world. And yet, as you were saying, being 
being Canadian from Quebec, it, it's a very different cosmovision. There's there's the English language, there's the French language, mm -hmm. there's the, the quote unquote Western <laughs> scientific knowledge, there's more of an indigenous perspective. So I imagine just living with Yashininka must have really opened you up to, to a lot of different ways of thinking as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, it's, um, look, I'll, I'll try to put it succinctly, but, um, uh, well, first of all, I field work. Uh, so this is what anthropologists do. If you know folks don't know what field work is, it's it's like when you're want to be a, do a doctor, you you do an internship in a hospital. You go to some hospital, and then there you are, and you you do that practice. And I think most medical doctors do that before they become doctors. Well, with anthropologists, you go and live somewhere. Uh, the uh, culture usually other than your own, even though you can also study your own culture, but, you know, classically. And when I was doing this, it was 35 years ago, anthropology was a lot more classical in that sense. So the idea was to become a doctor you, uh, in anthropology, you've got to go and live in some out of the way place with people. And you spend a year or two living with them and you don't really understand at first why they do things, but then you, you, you stick it out and you're supposed to just by doing participant observation, that's the method. So you sort of live with them, participate in their activities while observing them. And, and then through this kind of odd process, asking lots of stupid questions and so on, then finally you understand them a lot better when you're done than when you got there and then you write about it. Um, I mean, I'm simplifying outrageously, but basically that's it. Um, the experience of, of leaving uh, the comfort of the suburbs and the Western world and the library at Stanford and showing up in the Peruvian Amazon in an Ashaninka village in 1984 was pretty radical. Um, and um, I mean, the Peruvian Amazon itself is radical. There, it's 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 the the epicenter of world biodiversity. You go into the forest; it's three or four times taller than any kind of European forest. It has it's filled with all kinds of different species. It's it's kind of mind boggling. I was there to study what people knew about the forest. It turned out that they had names in their language for just about every species of plant, and I mean, there were more names in Ashaninka for Amazonian plants than in Latin given by science. Uh, they ascribed uses to about half of them. They, they had like in, encyclopedic knowledge about plant properties. Um, I didn't know anything about plants. I was just a kid from the suburbs. You know, it, and it, so it, it was soon obvious that these people had deep knowledge about the world in which they lived. And meanwhile, you know, they'd look at me and they'd say, um, oh, those rubber boots you have with the leather linings, those are fantastic. How did you make them? I said, well, look, you know, I didn't make them. I bought them. Um, yeah, okay, well, but how, how would you go about doing that? Uh, look, you know, I, I, sorry, I just can't, I can't tell you. I don't know. And, you know, they'd look at me like I was sort of withholding information or something. You know, he, I'm, he's pretending he's stupid. <laughs> Um, you know, and then, oh, what about your tape recorder? So how did you make that, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So you soon start feeling like you're a bit of a, and, 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 and so to answer your question, just, the, just being there, just hanging out with them, just seeing uh, what they saw of me, you know, looking at them, look at me. And, and so they, they thought, I was a really kind of a strange guy. It, it, it actually even got a little bit stranger, but uh, I'll finish this one first. I had the impression of being like an onion with layers of kind of prejudice where you, you think, okay, these are rainforest Indians and you know, I'm from Stanford. I kind of understand the world more than they do. And, and then you, these layers of, of, uh, uh, of preconceptions that get peeled off I, it felt like every every couple of weeks or so, what I thought I understood about the Ashaninka 15 days previously was contradicted by what I now knew. And that process went on for like two years. Um, it's true that ayahuasca and tobacco 
who also played a role in there. But I, I think, like first and foremost, just the uh, the the experience of leaving the comfort of your world and plunging into a radically different culture and trying to understand it is uh, very transformational. And I'll, I'll just tell you a, a brief story um, uh, on that count, which was that fairly early on uh, in the community, I was hanging out with the uh, some adolescents and they actually spoke Spanish, which, which I could speak. And uh, so we were talking and they had asked these questions like, um, would it be possible for me to travel to your world? So I'd say, well, look, um, yeah, you'd have to get an airplane in Lima and, and you'd probably have to get a passport and uh, a ticket would cost about $500. So you'd have to work for a couple of years, but I mean, concretely, it would be possible um, because um, here, how should I put it? So I, I, there was a, like a grapefruit and a lemon. And so I grabbed the grapefruit um, and said, well, um, look, if this is the sun, um, here's our, our planet and um, uh, peruse on this side of the lemon and um, where I live in Europe is on the other side. And so with the airplane, you know, once you got in Lima, you'd have to sort of fly around the globe. And that's why when it's like uh, noon here in Peru, it's already evening over in Europe where I live because it turns around the sun, which is the grapefruit, you know? So there I was uh, a zealous young missionary of rational science. Um, and I saw these uh, young Ashaninka people looking at me like I was out of my mind. Um, you know, like we're living on a lemon and he's on the other side of the lemon and what is he talking about? And I understood in uh, subsequent, so at, at first, you know, I thought, okay, these guys don't even know the world is round, ooh boy. Um, but then it turned out that it was more complicated than that. It was that they actually thought that the world had different levels, uh, like layers, and that white people came from the layer below, underground, um, where we live in these vast cities filled with complex technologies and airplanes and motors. And, and then we sometimes emerge at the level at which the Ashanika live, by coming out through lakes. And what we like to do is kidnap Ashaninka women and children, and then put electrodes in their bodies and melt their body fat and use that as oil that we need to run our machines. So wait a second. Okay, um, different levels. Uh, oh yes, and, and that's why we're white because we live underground. You're thinking, okay, well, um, and they call these uh, pistacos. So people would tell me stories about pistacos. And, um, but then I realized that actually they thought I was possibly a pistaco. Um, so what do these pistacos look like? Well, turns out they're not only white and male, but uh, they have blue eyes and beards. I just so happened to fit the description. And so then you know, at first you're thinking, wait a second, the, I mean, the, these people really think that I'm a vampire here to extract their body fat? I mean, you know, how, how do you, first of all, you discover that it's really difficult to prove that you're not a vampire. Um, you know, the more you try to prove that you're not a vampire, the more trouble you get into. But then, uh, a vampire, maybe. Um, but then um, thinking about it, it, it seemed pretty clear that what they were really saying was that white people have this tendency to extract. And, you know, like there'd be other times guys would come around my house and say, um, and they, they'd kind of bait me and say, look, um, oh, you know what? I know a river over there. There's quite a bit of gold in that river, it seems to me. And, you know, I could smell the bait. So I'd say, oh, gold, oh, I'm not interested in gold. What? Gringo not interested in gold? Whoa. 
because that was the question. And sometimes they'd, they'd ask me about my boots and my tape recorders, but then there'd be these questions like, well, how is it, why is it that uh, white people like, they, they like gold a lot, but uh, when you give them gold, they always want more. You know, you can, you give them and give them and give them, and then they, they just come back and they want more and more. They're never satisfied. What is it with this like obsessive extraction tendency? Um, uh, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, so I was continuing to try to prove that I wasn't a sort of uh, uh, obsessive extractor, but in fact, I was an obsessive extractor. In other words, I was there to extract data and to become a doctor in anthropology. I mean, I claimed that it was for the good of indigenous Amazonian people that I was doing this study to show that they use their resources rationally and therefore deserved the right to own their lands, which was a con supposed to be a contradiction of like the World Bank's policy at the time. But actually, it was also true that I was there to extract data and then to turn it into a, a doctoral dissertation and to become a doctor in anthropology, which would enhance my career and professional prospects. So actually, by hanging out with Ashaninka and seeing them, seeing myself in their own gaze, and you know, I learned, for example, that I came from a culture that was obsessed with extraction and that I myself participated in it without even realizing it. So these, these are the kinds of moments of, you know, realization that you can come to by doing field work without even taking ayahuasca and uh, tobacco. Um, I know this, this answer is getting kind of long, but that's the problem with this kind of question. But then, then I mean, then ayahuasca. So that, that was this, this thing where I'd, I'd ask people about the origin of their knowledge. Fairly, after a couple of months, I'd, we'd go into the forest, there'd be plants, and they'd say, this plant accelerates the healing of wounds, or this plant heals chronic backache. And if I had a wound, I actually had chronic backache as well. I tried these different remedies on myself to find that they worked, um, even though I didn't believe they were going to work. Um, and so then I started asking the question, how do you know what you know about plants? Because you, you seem to have verifiable knowledge about these plants. It's not just sort of superstitious balderdash. Um, so how do you know what you know? Oh, well, our ayahuasqueros, our tabaqueros take their ayahuasca, the hallucinogenic plant mixture, or eat tobacco paste, and in their visions, uh, speak with these entities that are sources of knowledge and give them information. That's how they know. Um, well, the first time I heard this, I thought the fellow who, who, who told me that was pulling my leg. I mean, you know, it couldn't be true. To think that there's verifiable information in your hallucinations is the definition of psychosis. Um, you know, if, if you believe that, you're nuts by definition. <laughs> um, but he wasn't smiling. And actually, I asked the same question to different people on different occasions. They gave the same answer. And then finally, one guy, I was in a, a neighboring village uh, at one point, um, because they actually squabbled over the anthropologist. You know, there's not much entertainment out there. So that after, after four months, the neighboring village said, it's not fair, you guys have that garden during the first day. And at the first night we were hanging out, drinking some manioc beer. And I brought out that question, oh, you, your knowledge about plants is remarkable. There we were in the garden today and so on. But so how do you know what you know, all these things you know about plants? And uh, one guy said, um, Brother Jeremy, you want to know the answer to that question, you have to drink ayahuasca. It's the television of the forest. And if you like, I'll show you sometime. You can see images and learn things. You know, I, I, the t television of the forest, it sounds, sounds kind of intriguing, but I, you know, I, I, 
even though I had experience with LSD and even psilocybin mushrooms, uh, you know, I didn't really think that this hallucinogenic uh, uh, vine extract was going to allow me to learn important things. But I thought it was interesting. It's also, there you are doing field work, bombarding people with questions about what they know and how they know what they know and so on. And finally, somebody says, look, if you want to understand, you have to drink this thing. And I'll show you if you want. To me, it seemed like a sort of a minimal uh, requirement to say yes, you know, just sort of basic politeness or else stay home and don't ask questions. Um, I also knew that it was probably not going to be part of my doctoral dissertation at that point because it was a little bit, 35 years ago is a different uh, thing, but um, I accepted kind of like out of private interest, you know, I was curious. And um, it, we did it on a Friday night and that seemed appropriate enough. You know, you, you do your field work uh, during the day and so on, but on Friday night, you do whatever you want. So, um, but the experience uh, was simply uh, extraordinary. Um, you know, I can, uh, I can tell you briefly, it was, uh, well, first of all, it was like n nothing close to the LSD or the psilocybin that I dabbled with. And this was uh, 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 pr profoundly hallucinogenic. I found myself surrounded by enormous fluorescent serpents that began explaining things to me in a telepathic language about what a small human being I was. Uh, my worldview collapsed in front of me. I could see how arrogant my rational humanist materialist take on things was. Um, I ended up flying out of my body. I mean, I was an, uh, an agnostic materialist and there I was uh, tens of kilometers above the planet and the planet was all covered in ice. And I'd never even heard of snowball earth. I actually think the, the hypothesis was formulated like eight years after this experience by, by other scientists. Um, so you, out of body looking down at the planet, it's all covered in ice and the shaman is, is singing this melody that seems to be directing the, the whole affair. When he, he modified his melody, I crashed back down into my body saw hundreds of thousands of images like uh, the veins of a human hand and the veins of a green leaf go flashing back and forth like this. Um, it, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was certainly, it wasn't out of the jumbled subconscious attic of my mind. It was stuff I'd never seen or thought about. And I mean, it was like being in a, a washing machine for three hours. And then, and the next day, when I went to freshen up by the river, I looked at a green leaf and then I looked at the veins of my human, of my hand, and I could see that it was true, that it was very similar, the same stuff, and that the overall experience, I felt like a, a walking plant. So just a little human being, but still part of this layer of life. And um, it, it, I felt reconciled with nature for the first time in 25 years. Um, and for an anthropologist, an anthropologist is a human who studies humans. Um, so you're pretty anthropocentric. There I was studying Ashaninka people. But what this plant brood did was, was kick me in the butt kick me off the pedestal of, of human self-importance and make me realize that there was more to life on earth than humans. Well, um, it, it took a, a bunch of years for me to realize just how important that was. In other words, when it is confirmed that ayahuasca teaches you uh, what you need to know rather than what you want to know, um, uh, I mean, not always, but at least in that case, uh, that's what happened to me. Um, knowing that there was more to the world we live in than human beings. Um, I mean, that's part of what I saw that night. Uh, I think that 
modified not only my worldview, but my subsequent career and, and so forth. That's why, even though I'm an anthropologist, I write about slime molds and uh, amoebas and plants and uh, so forth. You know, that they're uh, refusing to put up a barrier between humans and, and all the rest. And I mean, I had, I had a crash course in that, uh, thanks to the Ashaninka and their ayahuasca. And I think it's true that uh, ayahuasca in those circumstances uh, can be a formidable accelerator. It's true that, you know, I'd been living there for three, four months. I'd been eating very simple food, as it were. It, it was already a kind of a diet. The whole, ex the whole experience was already a diet. So it, it doesn't just suffice to drink ayahuasca and then presto, you understand everything. But I think that, uh, at least for me, at that point in, in time, that particular ayahuasca experience was extremely uh, enriching. So that's the thing to your question. And maybe I'd just add to it that um, uh, actually that ayahuasca experience was almost too strong. It scared me. I chickened out. Uh, I, I didn't really repeat the experience in a meaningful way. Um, I didn't write about it in my dissertation. I did everything I can I could to complete my study of the Ashaninka's rational uses of the rainforest. And then I spent a, a bunch of years, once I got the doctorate, working to raise funds for the demarcation of indigenous territories in the Amazon. And it was only after going through that, all that work, two years of writing a dissertation, three, four years of fundraising, where I would get, get up in public and say, look, you want to protect the rainforest, the best way to do it is to entrust it to the indigenous people who live there and are, are the only ones who know how to use it productively without destroying it, which was in fact a correct argument. And uh, this was in the early 1990s. But by holding that discourse often enough, I realized that there was something important that I was not saying, which is that these people themselves say that at the heart of their knowledge about the rainforest, there is this kind of shamanic relationship with these teacher plants like tobacco and ayahuasca. I was not saying that because I was busy raising funds saying that these people use the rainforest rationally. I didn't want to say, you know, so I, I was really soft peddling the hallucinogenic part. But after a while, it just seemed like, okay, well, um, uh, th this is um, incomplete. What I'm doing here is presenting an incomplete picture. And even though um, it's not a popular subject, uh, you know, hallucinogens and so forth, because in the early 1990s, uh, it wasn't like now. I mean, it, you get a lot of interest nowadays in ayahuasca. Back then, people, nobody had ever heard of ayahuasca. And uh, so, and you, you'd start saying, well, it's a liquid that makes you vomit, and then you see these serpents and so forth. Everybody's going, ooh, you know. Um, so it was a, a different world, but still, um, it, it took me like uh, from the initial ayahuasca experience I was describing in 1985 to actually rolling up my sleeves and deciding to look into ayahuasca and write a book about it, there were eight years eight years of writing a dissertation, raising funds, doing other things, but not kind of reading books or, or any of that business, and even less drinking ayahuasca, but just sort of getting my life ready to be in a space where finally I could look into it and think about it. Um, because uh, it's a very strong, powerful experience. And it was also the kind of experience that whenever I did try to talk about it to people around me in Europe, it, it was, you know, it, it was difficult. People uh, seemed to feel it was a subject that made people uneasy. So long answer to a simple question. That was, that was beautiful, Jeremy. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, there's a lot there um, that we could get into 
but I guess transitioning, I I know you spoke about in your book, uh, also, as you mentioned, being with the Ashaninka, I would imagine you became familiar with tobacco because that's that's a very big part of their work as well. In the book you talked about, I I can't remember if you were with a Shuar shaman, but you you took the tobacco paste, uh, sometimes it's called ambio. And you had a very mm-hmm. powerful experience, uh, which <laughs> if you feel like recounting again, you can, but, but I would imagine that sure. that's, a, that's another very transformative experience because, again, we come well, with all of these, these conditions of what tobacco is. That's a very different way of consuming it. And, and even the, the way you described it in the book, that's something that I think very few people would even have an idea that that's a possibility, that that's, a, that's one of the effects that tobacco can have. So was that, was that you kind of mentioned also with, with ayahuasca, which I think is very beautiful in a way that <clears throat> it was almost so strong that, that you were hesitant to talk about it, because I, I think it's a common experience that people have that when they really go deep, there's this almost fine line between it. it's very sacred and it's also it can be so terrifying that that we have to avoid it for a while we almost there has to be a time that passes before we even feel comfortable kind of going back into that experience of so beginning to in a way uh to allow that to unfold so was that a similar thing with tobacco and and then at a certain point you just felt like there was there was kind of this whole area of knowledge that wasn't being talked about. And, and that's what you felt called to begin to share with that. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, um, it's a question that makes me realize uh, the difference b- between tobacco and ayahuasca for me. Um, I think I felt a lot more at ease with the hallucinogenic ayahuasca than with tobacco. Um, Tobacco never was my plant. Um, my father was a chain smoker of cigarettes who gave up and became a zealous anti-smoker. So I didn't have a very favorable opinion of, you know, tobacco. And then the Ashaninka, I mean, the number one shamanic plant for them is tobacco. Their word for uh, shaman is sherry, piari, sherry is tobacco. So the, it's tobacco doctor. And, you know, anybody would have any kind of ailment, the first thing they'd do would be to blow tobacco smoke on it. Um, It was tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. Um, um, Okay, well, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a huge tobacco fan, but I can take notes and, and, and so forth. And, um, um, well, one day I was with my main informant, who was a 48-year-old uh, Ashaninka man, Carlos Perez. And he invited me to accompany him uh, about an hour uh, up in the hills to where his old tabaquero teacher lived. So Carlos was mainly a tobacco shaman, but he also would take ayahuasca occasionally, but he identified as a tabaquero. And his... Uh, his teacher was a, an old man. He was so old that he didn't even know how old he was. He was born before the Ashaninka started counting, but I reckoned he was in his 80s. Um, so we, we went up and visited this, this old uh, fellow, and there he was sitting in his old cotton gown on a, on a, just on a mat. Uh, and he had a, a gourd um, with, a, with a stick in it and this was his tobacco paste. And so when uh, Carlos introduced me, the, the old man started asking me in Ashaninka whether I was his father-in-law. Uh, and so, you know, these guys are, these are old tricksters and so on. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna play along with the old guy. So, you know, I, I answered yes. And then he asked me again and I answered yes. And then we had this r- ridiculous back and forth where he asked me, 20 times in a row, whether I was his father-in-law. I answered yes every time, and he, he would, his laugh would get a little bit longer. I learned later that night from Carlos that the question also meant, Can I, may I sleep with your daughters? <laughs> so the joke was on me for sure, but I mean, I didn't even know it at the time. So um, I thought, okay, I'm, uh, now that we've 
been playing ping pong for 20 times. Uh, I'll, I'll put an end to this. And so I asked him, hey, could I try some of your tobacco paste? So he said, sure. And he handed me the gourd. And so yeah, I, he kind of dutifully took a, what seemed to be a decent amount and ran the stick through my uh, uh, under through my lips. And then kind of just sat aside and, and uh, to allow the, the gentleman to get on with their, their business. And that, that's also what doing field work is. You know, you're, you're in this place and in the middle of the forest, there was a river next, next door. These two guys are talking away in Ashaninka. You don't understand uh, mainly what, the, what they're saying. Um, so you're, you're just sort of staring blankly at, at whatever. And, um, you know, uh, after about 10 minutes, I started feeling like I was running my, my um, tongue under my teeth. And they seemed like really long, really sharp. And I, I could taste like a taste of blood in my mouth. And at the time I was still a vegetarian and, but I, I and I liked this taste. And then I felt my, I felt like I had whiskers here that were growing out of the side of my face. And meanwhile, I started staring at these chickens that were, were clucking around and I decided not to pounce on them. I started feeling like a, a, a feline, a, a kind of a wise, warm, slightly aggressive, but nonetheless controlled feline. And, you know, I'll tell you, this was the kind of thing that I didn't think was possible in any way. And now I'm not claiming that I transformed into a jaguar. But I had a really deep body-based feeling, and it was exhilarating. It was kind of like when you when you dream that you're flying, you're dreaming, and it, but in your dream you're flying. And when you have that, ah, you can fly and fly. And you know, uh, I think most people enjoy dreams in which they fly. I certainly have enjoyed my um, uh, flying dreams. There are not too many of them, but this one. So it wasn't a dream. It was like. I could actually feel in my body what it felt like to be a powerful jungle feline. And it lasted about 15 minutes. And, and then it subsided. And, um, and then that, that was it. Um, I didn't talk about it with anybody really. I took notes about it. But then I found that it was something that I could like conjure up. I could, uh, and, and, and in the decades that follow, if I needed to go inside and to tap a kind of uh, uh, feline feeling where, so, and actually I've used it for public speaking. You know, how do you get over being nervous in front of a whole bunch of people? You tap into that uh, jaguar thing and, um, you know, feel how sharp your teeth are. And, and so it's a strange thing because with ayahuasca, you see things and then you, you, it's hard to unsee them. So they stay with you. But here it wasn't seeing things. It was feeling something that had been imprinted deep down in the body. Um, and it was also, I mean, it was so crazy and off the charts that I think the first time I spoke about it publicly was in 2005 at, uh, at the Bioneers conference. I actually told that story. I did my, my tobacco uh, uh, Jaguar coming out in 2005. So 20 years after the experience. And, you know, I got people at Bioneers, I think appreciated the story and kind of laughed and stuff, but I realized that it wasn't really a story that was that easy to tell uh, at that time. Um, and actually, I was a lot happier using it rather than discussing it. So over the years, I've, I've been, you know, what, put a tiger in your tank, you know, I, I've had a tiger in my tank since that one experience. Um, and um, I'm happy. Uh, I think it was extremely interesting. It's taken about 35 years to feel comfortable discussing it uh, sort of more regularly. Um, it's not something that I've been in a hurry to repeat. 
I'm still not a tobacco person. I mean, it doesn't call me. It's it's not when I, I, I am surrounded by people who use tobacco, but it's just not my plant. Um, and, you know, once you've had that feline feeling, you don't need to take more tobacco. I mean, it's there. I can tap into it. It's, uh, um, you know, so uh, I've got a lot of respect for tobacco and uh, and the Ashaninka's knowledge of how to prepare this kind of paste. And and I'm, I'm fortunate, I, you know, I, I, we, we, uh, we know that tobacco can be pretty addictive depending on, on which tobacco you're working with and how you consume it. I mean, for me, it's been the opposite. It's been that that experience was so strong. I haven't needed to. scary. The tobacco experience was like thrilling, exhilarating, and, and, and warm, and body-based, yet not something that I was in a hurry to repeat. You know, so that, that's what I can say about it. And, and obviously, we're a million miles away from, from what is smoking industrial cigarettes. Um, you know, that's just, it's... Um, uh, just a completely different uh, sport. So uh, that would be my answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. But you, you, you yourself are practicing uh, tobacco, tabaquero. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's always a little bit strange using these words, but I, I, I was trained in a, in a lineage that, that predominantly works with tobacco. And uh, at a certain point, my, my main teacher also kind of gave me that authority to begin working with it. And, and so it's been a slow process of, of beginning to obviously first do, do the work in myself and then uh, beginning to slowly administer that as well. And, and I think like you describe, it's uh, the way you described it is very beautiful. It is, it's a very, I think, lived experience. It, it's very much in the body. I, I remember the, the first time I, I worked with tobacco, it was seven, seven days of drinking it consecutively. And, and the first time I, I thought for sure I was going to die. It was the closest to death I had felt. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if it was a stubbornness or just a, a deep trust in, in him, but I, I came back for the second night. Again, I, I thought for sure I was going to die. And I think after the third or fourth, it, at least that feeling began to pass, but it was extremely strong. And I, you know, even to this day, I, I don't know exactly what happened in that process, but, but I remember emerging from it feeling that something very, very pronounced had shift and, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know what it was, but I, I felt very different. And it was something that, that actually I saw reflected more in how other people viewed me that, that I realized like something very, very dramatic had changed. And, and that for me was really the, the calling to tobacco. It was something I had wanted to work with for a long time, but, but I had never found the, the place or the person. And, and when, I, when I finally found the guy I worked with, it was just very clear that, that I needed to, to continue that. But um, yeah, I think the way you describe it is, is, is really beautiful. Um, for so many people, when they hear tobacco, you know, obviously it's changing as, as people become more exposed to, to plant medicines like ayahuasca, even if they sit in, a, in an ayahuasca ceremony, as I think you very poignantly pointed out in the book, it's very rare that ayahuasca would be used without tobacco, many plants actually, for that matter, that tobacco is often considered like in a more indigenous perspective, they would say it's it's the the food of the gods or the food of the spirits that the spirits feed on on that that essence that spirit of tobacco whether it's the smoke or the the intentionality. Um, so I think more people are becoming aware that the tobacco is used in that way, even from where you come from or where I come from in the U.S. And I, I remember even growing up, a lot of the Native American cultures had a huge reverence for tobacco, and it was always. 
this very strange kind of dichotomy, as you spoke about these two different cosmovisions, because the cosmovision I came from was also my father smoked a lot. I couldn't stand it. I remember being in cars with the windows rolled up and it was, it was the worst thing ever being in a plane. I thought I was going to die. So I, I, you know, it was very difficult to kind of understand the, 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 the native American view that this was a sacred plant, a medicine, a tool, <laughs> and being in these enclosed plains where it was like death, you know, around me. Um, so with, with the book that you wrote, and, and, and I guess maybe addressing a general audience that, that maybe is familiar with plants, but, but not so much with tobacco, you mentioned that for the Ashaninka, tobacco was their, their main medicine plant. And, and that's true with a, a lot of groups uh, all over the, the Americas. How would you describe, and I, I know, again, this is a big question, but how would you describe tobacco as a medicine? Because that's a very, very foreign concept to a lot of people, even doing a lot of ayahuasca work. That's often one of the talks that we have to give <laughs> in the beginning is, you know, people are going to be working with tobacco. The, the cordanderos will be working with tobacco. This is why they're doing it. Um, so from, from your research, from your understanding to, to maybe a lay person or someone who's maybe curious, how would you describe tobacco as, as medicine and not how most people think of it? Well, um, here I think that uh, Western science uh, can be useful. Um, actually, tobacco is the plant that science has most studied because um, I think that uh, Western intellectuals were uh, fascinated by the power of tobacco and they wanted to know how it worked. So 200 years ago, in the early days of biology, they started looking into where does nicotine, they'd figured out that there was an alkaloid and that, it would, that they called it nicotine after Jean Nico, who was a French uh, uh, botanist. And, um, so Nico's substance, this nicotine. So where, where does it go in the body? And by following nicotine in the body, they discovered that it um, would fit into what seemed like receptors on the surface of cells and in particular neurons. And these receptors were called nicotinic receptors. It turns out that um, it's not that the body is ready to receive nicotine, it's that nicotine imitates a, a fundamental substance that the body use, which is acetylcholine. And these are acetylcholine receptors. But at, the, at that time, scientists didn't know about acetylcholine. These receptors got called nicotinic receptors. Um, they're all over the body, not just in, in neurons and many different cell types. What happens, it turns out, uh, so science has long studied what then happens in the human body. It turns out that, um, so science discovered the exist existence of receptors that went on the last 200 years have been discovering all the different kinds of receptors that exist in the human body, not just for acetylcholine, but for serotonin and dopamine and glutamate and so forth. Um, well, uh, nicotine has this very complex impact on the human body. Um, it uh, accelerates uh, the heartbeat. It uh, sends more blood to the brain um, by affecting acetylcholine receptors. This in turn, so it releases acetylcholine and then this um, uh, stimulates dopamine receptors and serotonin receptors, and glutamate, and noradrenaline, which is a form of adrenaline. So actually, the experience you have of uh, tobacco is an experience of nicotine, but it's also an experience of these different deep biological uh, processes. I actually think that my, my experience of feeling like a feline, this, this warmth, this so some this uh, aggressive feeling where I could almost attack the, the chickens. It, what does nicotine, it, it also releases testosterone. So when you get a rush of nicotine in your body, you're also getting a rush of adrenaline and testosterone and dopamine. So, you know, this is a, a, an intense hormonal experience. Um, 
So, yes, how can it be a medicine? Well, just simply because it, it affects our biology deep, deep down, and it can affect it one way or another. Um, what's important to see about acetylcholine um, is that it is the first receptor in the fetus. In other words, before the, the, the unfolding fetus sets up the different kinds of cells and different kinds of receptors, the first receptor and, and uh, uh, hormone that it uses is acetylcholine. So it's like the most fundamental biological receptor. It's not just in human beings, you have it in algae, in, in, in all animals. And this is why plants like tobacco use it. Uh, and uh, actually uh, snake venoms also uh, meddle with acetylcholine receptors. If you want to um, put a spanner in the works of animals and you're a plant. So nicotine essentially functions as an insecticide. That's why the plant, this is why scientists think the plants produce nicotine. So insects that come and chomp on tobacco leaves um, are going to get all discombobulated or even paralyzed or even fall dead because nicotine, it's the pure form of nicotine is extremely uh, deadly. If you could extract the nicotine from a couple of ordinary cigarettes and concentrate it into a drop and then swallow that drop, that would be enough to kill you. The reason why smoking a couple of cigarettes doesn't kill you is that most of the nicotine goes up in smoke, fortunately. So nicotine is, is a very powerful substance. It can, it, uh, uh, just a little bit of it can kill an animal, but smaller doses have these different impacts. So like, for example, one thing is that nicotine is an analgesic to a certain extent, a painkiller. So one thing that uh, Amazonian people do, somebody has a wound, they'll take a, a fresh tobacco leaf and put it on the wound. Actually, nicotine goes through the skin a thousand times more uh, uh, efficiently than when you smoke it. So putting tobacco on your skin is an extremely efficient way of delivering nicotine into your body and, uh, and topically. And then there's the tobacco smoke. I mean, you know, initially when I was doing my field work, they'd, they'd bring a baby with a fever over to uh, my tabaquero uh, informant and he'd pull out some tobacco and start blowing tobacco smoke on this baby. I was thinking, there's, you know, you, there, how, how can blowing tobacco smoke? So you, you and me, we were trapped in the, the, our cars with our dads smoking cigarettes. We think, how could this be medicinal? It's disgusting. But um, these were not industrial cigarettes, but real tobacco and smoked on people. And they use it to calm and soothe and dry the body. They have a whole, a whole theory of it along those lines. Then there's also that... Tobacco is the diagnostic tool. Um, so it's not just that it's an analgesic and it can calm people and, uh, and take pain away. It's also that the, the doctor, the tobacco doctor, will smoke it or eat it and then think about the problem and come up with a diagnostic. You know, just, just think those professors smoking their pipes and uh, thinking about important questions. Um, so it's a tool also for thinking and finding solutions. So all this me makes it in the um, uh, Amazonian view, the number one shamanic plant, the number one medicinal plant, the most frequently used uh, treatment. And um, yeah, I think that for a, a Westerner, once you understand understand how, how deep the physiological impact of, uh, of the, the plant is, uh, then it becomes understandable. Um, it, it turns out that nicotine, for example, can, can do things like stimulate the growth of, um, of blood vessels. You know, it, it can have impacts that can be positive or can be negative. If you have diabetes and your, uh, your uh, blood vessels, your capillaries are kind of uh, waning, you can use uh, tobacco paste, and this will help the creation of new blood vessels. On the other hand, if you have a tumor, you don't want to be con containing nicotine because 
uh, that tumor will be able to grow bigger blood vessels and feed itself more efficiently. So um, tobacco often has, or nicotine has a um, uh, paradoxical effect. It can be used for poison. It can be used for medicine. It can be de depending on just what the problem is. So you want to uh, know how to use it and control how you use it. You can't just use it indiscriminately and smoke 20 cigarettes a day every day, for example. That's not going to work. And that's not how you work with tobacco. It's too powerful for that. Yeah. You mentioned in the beginning, and I think uh, one of the really kind of beautiful things that you did with this book was writing it from your perspective, but also from someone who works with that plant, from Raphael. Um, could you speak a little bit about what that experience was like, what, what you learned from him? And, and you, you mentioned, I think very beautifully, you discussed a lot of the ideas through this lens of, of how he looks at the world. And, and I think very beautifully too, like he, he seemed like he, and maybe it was because he's also a teacher, but he also really seemed to have this very beautiful discernment of, of being able to bridge these worlds together. Like when you mentioned something, he could say like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense because that's also how I see something. Um, and I think you, you did a beautiful job of, of describing how to take that and look at it through this other cosmovision that most of us come from. And, and I know it's, it, it's all, always a little difficult to speak through the lens of someone else. Obviously, that's, <laughs> I think, why you brought him in too, because he does a beautiful job. But um, could you speak a little bit about maybe how he looks at, at, at tobacco through, through his lens and, and, and what that looks like? I mean, even some really beautiful, I think, ideas of, of what it means to be an integrity and, and, and what it means to, to, to be a doctor, to, to hold that space, these ideas of, of, of even like the, the spirit, you know, I, because I think that's something that it's very hard for a lot of Westerners to, to grasp is this idea that these plants have a spirit. And I think the way he described that was, was very beautiful. And, and I think it, it, it allows someone who's maybe not immersed in that world to actually begin to understand it in a way. And, and, and very much as you were saying, to begin to bridge these two worlds, which I think is so valuable for, for so many reasons. Yeah, um, well, it, it's true. Raphael uh, Chanchari has a real talent for um, um, give, giving his point of view, telling his story, and and uh, embodying, as it were, uh, the Amazonian point of view or an Amazonian point of view on uh, just these two plants, but on many other subjects too. And when it comes to uh, these two plants, tobacco and ayahuasca, um, for him, it's just clear that these are teachers. And uh, he refers to tobacco and ayahuasca like uh, you and I might refer to our favorite university teacher, the person that one would listen to for s semesters and take notes and the, the professor who knew so much. And, and there it is, except that it's not a dusty old professor in the form of a human body. It's a, it's a real life plant. And, and these teacher plants, um, I mean, they hold them in some kind of awe in terms of these are very powerful beings. And these are beings that are more powerful than we are. And we're lucky if we can interact with them. Uh, you know that, that you, you can get in, they're, they're, they're almost too powerful. So it's a, these you never master these master plants. What you go, what you can do is try to avoid them mastering you. So there are procedures. So there's a lot of know-how, a lot of respect, a lot of experience. Rafael's been working with these plants for for over thirty years, um, and so there it is. I'd invite people to 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 read his words, and I, I felt that that is by far the, um, the best way to do it. Instead of having an anthropologist telling you what the Amazonians say, turn on the mic, transcribe what the Amazonian says, run it by him once it's done to make sure he agrees, and then voila, 
the unvarnished words of Raphael Chanchari that correspond to what he thinks. And lo and behold, if it isn't easy to understand, um, I put it quite simply. Um, I think Amazonian people personify the world to understand it. And I think that science objectifies the world to understand it. So we look at tobacco as scientists or scientifically informed, we'll say, okay, it contains molecules, they, they're alkaloids, the main alkaloid is nicotine, it fits into nicotinic receptors, et cetera, et cetera. We just went over all that. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, Raphael will be looking at the same plant and uh, will look at it like a person that he's known for a long time that has a, a clear, rather strong personality. He describes all of these teacher plants as, as having a kind of a double identity that uh, so that they're powerful, but and so they can they can help you heal people, they can help you harm people, that there is a funda fundamental ambiguity there, and that you can't approach them without uh, know-how, prudence, and knowledge. But that's, that's the, the way to go about them. So just listening to Raphael, I, I, because I think this is one of the things of, of being an anthropologist, finally, is you, you learn how to ask people questions. In other words, you get them to tell their stories. Um, but you don't say, tell me a story about this or that, but you ask them a question. And, and then when they go off, they go to the races telling you about the time that their teacher uh, uh, insisted on how he, uh, he should learn ayahuasca properly or some other story. Then you don't interrupt them and, and you let the, the, the recorder go. And you know once people are up and running and they're giving their lived experience, then just let them do that. And then when they stop, then you can come up with the next question. So, you know, and it's called like active listening or something like that. You also need a good customer, as they say. I mean, Rafael's a good customer in that, you know, you give him the mic and the guy speaks in paragraphs. It's, it's uh, that, that was the, the thing is I thought, okay, even before thinking about writing a book, I thought, man, maybe I'll write a small text about tobacco. Uh, how could I do that? Oh, I'll speak with a guy who knows tobacco. I'll start with an interview with Raphael and see and see how that goes. And so we had what turned out ended up being the first chapter. It's the transcription of uh, an interview that lasted less than an hour. And I, I thought the the end result was so good that it it was it, it was a paragraph. It was a chapter. There it was. All you had to do was go and sit down with the guy for an hour. Um, transcribe it properly, I mean, clean it up a little bit, and, and presto, you have a whole chapter on the indigenous Amazonian point of view on, the, on tobacco. Check it out. <laughs> I mean, it's live. It's like live music or something. Um, it doesn't need, uh, you know, orchestral maneuvers. Nothing. Yeah. Well, wonderful, Jeremy. I, I know we're coming up on our time. Um, is there anything that, that we, we didn't touch on that you'd like to address? Um, uh, yeah, I thought we, we, we went around the track, uh, went around the track. Um, I think, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I've been very happy speaking with you and I also like your active listening and uh, the quality of your questions. So um, uh, I felt like I was in good company there. It's also true that um, uh, I think these are subjects uh, that um, are worth reading about, which is why I thought it would be good to write about them. In other words, they're complicated. Uh, there actually is research. It can be made understandable. Um, you know, the details are interesting. And if you really want to get a sort of a clear understanding of what is tobacco, what we now know about ayahuasca, and so on, it's worth not just listening to podcasts, but also actually reading. And what we tried to do with this book was make it short, make it clear, nothing, you, you know, it's, it's, it's simple words and stuff. And it concentrates, it's sort of like, 
what you need to know if you're going to work with these plants. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm not saying that uh, books are better than podcasts, but I think that, and, and podcasts are fine, and, and listening to two, two people talk is, is uh, always, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's a good formula too. But um, these are the kinds of subject that, that actually also warrant some, some writing. Um, you know, I, I'd compare it to, it's something like going sailing on the high seas or going and climbing uh, uh, the mountains in the Himalayas or something. You know, you, you, it's, worth, it's worth doing your homework with these plant teachers. And um, podcasts only go so far when you have homework to do. That's, uh, that'd, be, uh, that'd be what I'd add. <laughs> yeah. Well, beautiful, Jeremy. Um, I, I read the book and I think you did a, a beautiful job. Um, I, I often mention that there's a teacher who I, I work with. His name is Amika. He comes from the, a group of people called the Tubu in the Colombian Amazon. And uh, his, his people have this story, uh, which has been told for generations. And he, uh, when he was a kid and listening to his, his grandfather speak, he thought, well, these people are crazy. What are they talking about? And, but basically they were talking about the end of their, their, their time in the forest, that they would have to relocate to, to these strange cities that were full of these, these, these lighter skinned people with, with blue eyes and that they would begin to lose their culture. But his grandfather told him that it was it was a new time was coming and it was the time of a people that he called the Diro Amasa, which is the children of the new dawn. And it was these people who could take the, the, the medicine of the four directions and bring them together to create a new Maloka, which is a, a, not only a, a house, a, but, a, but a ceremonial place and also a representation of, of the world and the universe. And so essentially bringing these medicines together to create a new earth. and. Uh, and I think people like you are, are really doing that. And, and so I really honor that. And I think, you know, even as you were talking, uh, you know, 35 years or more of doing this work, that's, that's very admirable. And uh, that the world has changed a lot since then. And, and I think it, it's, it's very hard for people sometimes even to realize like how, how different the world was back then and, and, and really being a pioneer. And, and that takes a lot of, I think, knowledge and wisdom and courage. You know, the, there weren't a lot of resources back then when you're drinking ayahuasca or taking tobacco. It, it, is, it is and was a very foreign concept. And, and I think to create those bridges like you're doing is, is really medicine of this time. So I thank you for doing that. And, and I think the book is a great job. And I, I think very much uh, embodying that, that idea of, of creating bridges uh, to, to share this knowledge, to to really get it out there. And, you know, I think as you very wisely said, uh, you know, none of these, none of these cosmovisions, we, we should take from them the beauty, but not idealize them too, whether that's Western science or indigenous knowledge, that in essence, there's, there's beauty in all of them. And, and how do we bring those knowledges together and, and, and create something new? So I thank you for doing that. And, and your book is amazing. It's, uh, I think it's a really important subject, both on ayahuasca and tobacco, which isn't talked about so much. It's, uh, it's called Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge, I believe. And um, if people if people are interested in getting that book, they they can get it uh, on Amazon. Or uh, do you have a website where they can go to to get that as well? Um, I don't, but I, you can even go to a bookstore. I think and get it. So um, you know yeah. the old way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think yeah, it's available on uh, uh, on different uh, online uh, platforms. And look, uh, my turn to thank you. And uh, next time I'm in Peru, I'm hoping to go to Peru next year. I'll, I'll let you know. Maybe we could get together for, uh, for uh, a juice. <laughs> That'd be great, Jeremy. I'd, I'd love that. Well, thank you for your time. And um, okay. if, if people are interested in learning more about you, is there any way they can connect with you? Or You know, I, I have a Facebook page, which I sometimes, whenever I publish something or put something on there that I paste it up there uh, or otherwise um, the books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to, uh, I think, I think books is a good place to put sort of, you know, the knowledge, uh, even though podcasts are fine and <laughs> stuff like that, but um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate okay. it. Okay. All right, Jason. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your, for your, your time too. 
All right, everybody, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jeremy. Uh, for me, it was really a pleasure and an honor to be able to sit down with him. Um, like I said at the end, he's, uh, I think, really one of the pioneers of, of this work and uh, has contributed a lot to, to, to the field of plant medicine and, and really getting a lot of this knowledge out to a bigger audience. So uh, thank you to him for coming on, for sharing his knowledge. Uh, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a, a really beautiful way of doing that. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month. You can contribute. There's different tiers you can sign up for, and those tiers give you different things back, uh, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. To all the people who have done that, to all of the patrons, thank you very much. As always, I, I really appreciate your support. And if you're able to do that, thank you very much in advance. There's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. Also, with the YouTube channel now, there's the option to join the channel, and that gives you a lot of the same perks as the Patreon page. Um, if you're not able to do that, as always, to help with the algorithms to get the show out to a bigger audience. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bells, liking the videos, uh, leaving any comments in the comment section, that's always a really helpful way to help to grow this show. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, following the show, and if you can, leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's always a really big help. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, my next guest coming up... Um, I'm actually headed to the Peruvian Amazon very soon uh, to, to, to work at the Temple of the Way of Light. I'll be doing three workshops there. So I'll probably be offline for a while, but I've shot a number of episodes in advance to be able to publish for, for when I'm out of, uh, out of uh, kind of mainstream civilization for a while. Um, I have my friend Sandra coming on, Sandra Hamilton. She's an herbalist, so we talk a lot about herbalism and uh, plant medicines. Uh, Samer Muad is coming on. He's a guy who I met here in the Sacred Valley who has done a lot of work with ayahuasca and now does a lot of work with wachuma and also plant and food medicine. Uh, really fascinating conversation. And then I think the following episode is actually one with me where I was interviewed for someone else's podcast, so I'll be publishing that. Uh, and then when I'm down in the Amazon, I hope to do a number of interviews with some of the Shipibo healers there. Uh, probably some of the facilitators. There's a Matse Selder who I would really like to interview. So hopefully some really good interviews while I'm down there that I'll be able to publish once I'm out of the Amazon. So that's it. Thank you all for tuning in. Again, I hope you enjoy this interview. Thank you all for the support, and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank mm -hmm. you.